<laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've been asked to introduce Ajahn Brahm as a very prominent member of early Buddhism who of takes the, the Dhamma Vinaya, <laughs> okay, the Thai forest tradition, but I, I don't know if that's, yeah. yes, the Thai forest tradition is bigger than just the Wat Pa Pong branch of monasteries. And so anyway, that's a mute point, but I think the point is that Jan, that you um, you take the Buddha as your refuge and guide. So, oh yeah. Yes, we're just messing around here. Sorry for that. <laughs> Jim <laughs> Brown, put me on the spot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, so let's get started. That's okay. Get started. No getting you any more into let's any more go. trouble. Yeah. So, um, because okay, you. You or me? No, I was just going to say that. Um, We'll do the Sutta class for about 40 minutes or so, and then a five minute break, and then we'll have some Q&A again, which you can Excellent. please submit your questions to Anne-Marie, and we'll do our very best to get to questions or people who haven't asked before, as far as we can. So we'll do our best. Thank you. Take Excellent. Away. So now I'm going to start off uh, with um, that document, the word of the Buddha, which uh, allowed to be posted uh, for your um, for your review and contemplations, and uh, the part which deals with anapanasati or meditation on the path is basically being completed. So, if a little bit extra here, I'm going to start on page 24, and this is the uh, two extremes and the middle doctrine. I'll read it out first of all, and then. I'll just say a few words about it. And obviously you'll have an opportunity later on for questions. And there'll also be a few other really interesting parts of the Dhamma to be said afterwards. And I want to try and finish off if I can with the seven uh, people in the water simile to describe what enlightenment is in an easy way. So here we go. This is from Samyutta, uh, the uh, Nidana Samyutta, all about dependent origination and the 15th Sutta there. The two extremes and the middle doctrine. Venerable sir, it is said right view, right view. In what way is the right view? This is important, the first factor of the Eightfold Path, in a way maybe you haven't seen before. This world, Kachana, mostly depends upon a duality. It's not one of those dualities you may hear in other religions or other parts of Buddhism. This is a duality now explained upon a theory of existence or upon a theory of non-existence. Naturally, things being or things not being at all. But for one who sees the origin of phenomena as it really is, there is no idea of non-existence of the world. And for one who sees the cessation of phenomena as it really is, there is no idea of existence in the world. In other words, between being and non-being, in between those, there is something else. The third option. People always argue, are you or are you not? And this is the third option. Most people are attached to one of those wrong views, but one with right view disengages from such dualistic theories about my soul. You have no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only suffering arising. And what ceases is only suffering ceasing. That's the what I, first of all, you might call it, if you think that's a bit too tough, what arises is only suffering arising, what ceases is only suffering ceasing. You might call it what arises is only irritation arising. And what ceases is irritation ceasing. So there's five, six senses irritating the peace. <clears throat> they find that, oh, it's wonderful. But the silence, the cessation is even more powerful and peaceful. Your knowledge about this is independent of mere belief and acceptance. It's not what you learn in school or you have faith in because of someone like me. It's independent of faith or doctrine. It's from your direct experience. In this way, right view. And to 
make it clearer to explain further. Phenomena exist as one extreme. Phenomena do not ex exist as a second extreme. Without fearing to either of these extremes, the Buddha teaches the Dhamma by the middle. This is another middle way. And what is that middle way? With delusion as the cause, volition arises. With the volition as arises, then um, <coughs> consciousness arises. This is dependent origination, just in brief. And then the Buddha continues. If there was a soul, a permanent essence, would there be what belongs to a soul, its attributes? Yes, Venerable Sir, you can't have a soul without something belonging to it, its attributes. Or if there were what belongs to a soul, would there be a soul? Yes, Venerable Sir. Since a soul and any attributes of a soul are not apprehended as true and established, then this basic belief, namely this is the soul, this is the world, after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, I shall endure as long as eternity, would it not be an utterly and completely foolish belief? Yes. Such speculative beliefs are called the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, the contortion of views, the procrastination of views, the fetter of views. I really get into that, um, that description. They're called the thicket of views. If you've ever been through a thicket, it's just so hard to get through them to the other side. They're thorny, they are thick, and just if you've ever been in a sort of a wilderness area or where there's lots of thickets, it's just so hard to, to walk through them. The wilderness of views, there's no, nothing there, it's just no substantial reality. The con <coughs> contortion of views, when people try to explain them, they have to go backwards and forwards, bending the ideas backwards and forwards until you wonder why they can even just hold on to them. The procrastination of views, just being too lazy to actually to go forward and finding out that they are wrong. And the fetter of views, which means you cannot go deeper into your meditation or get free. Shackled by the fetter of views, the unenlightened person is not free from birth, aging and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, unhappiness and distress. They're not free from suffering, I say. So just quickly and brief that this third way, it's not a thing, it's not nothing. Instead, it's called the dependent origination. In other words, a process. Empty phenomena roll on without a core, which is always there. No core, no creator God, no soul, but one cause going to another. This is the third way. You don't say there's nothing. You can hear me. You can feel your body. There's something going on. You can't say there's nothing, but you can't say there is something because as soon as it arises, it passes away almost immediately. It's a beautiful third option of existence and non-existence. Instead, it's process, an empty process. And I often mention that because I was a physicist before, that over in the old Cavendish laboratory over in uh, Cambridge, we had the room here where Rutherford, who's a Kiwi physicist, New Zealander, brilliant, he split the atom. What do I say that for? Because 2,400 years earlier than that, maybe 2,500 years earlier, the fellow called the Buddha split the Atma. like the atom in physics. The word atom is a Greek word. It comes from indivisible. You're not supposed to be able to split it up. Something which is the essence of physical stuff, the atom. And of course, a great Kiwi physicist split it up, showed it wasn't so the essence of material. This is the way the Buddha split the atma to realize that too is splittable. It's not permanent. It's made of parts. It's a process. 
with no unsplittable permanent essence, a core inside. And I need some more linguistics who uh, understand the connection between Greek and Sanskrit. But I'm pretty sure that there must be a great connection there between Atma and Atom. But anyway, that's for another time. Now, uh, what's the point of that? It is because that once that process stops, it's not that something has been annihilated. There was nothing there, nor was there something. It was in between. The third option, a process, an empty process, is now finished. Nothing has been destroyed. And we'll come on to that in a few moments. Now, the body and the mind. This is Samyutta 1261. This is also the Nidana Samyutta. And this Nidana, again, dependent origination of key teaching of Buddhism. The unenlightened worldling might experience revulsion from this body, let its importance fade away and be liberated from it. Why? Because growth and decay are seen in this body. Even my body, sometimes I look at a picture of me when I first ordained, I was young and handsome and fit, but no, no longer. My body is decayed. And I can see a Venal Chanda's body in front of me now, you know, her face, that's decaying really fast. <laughs> so we're all getting older and decaying. So you might feel revulsion to this body. And why? Because growth and decay are seen in this body. More of it is born and dies, and you don't have any doubt about that. But that which is called mind, chitta, or that which is called mentality, that's mano, or that which is called consciousness, vinyana. Now, again, this may be a pedantic point, a fine point, but the Buddha uses the adjective wa, V long A, which means or, not and. That which is called mind, or chitta, or vinyana consciousness, we all have different words for it. This is the way people use words, not as they a lawyer or a philosopher, but all the people in the street. That which is called, you call mind, chitta, consciousness, or whatever, the unenlightened worldling is unable to experience revulsion towards it. Let its importance fade away and be liberated from it. Why? Because for a long time, they have held, appropriated, and grasped the wrong view. This chitta, this mind, this consciousness, whatever you call it, is mine. This I am. This is the permanent essence. What I say very clearly, things like original mind, cosmic consciousness, the ground of all being, because people have held that for such a long time, for many lives, they find it difficult to experience turning away from it. And they still hold that that is the permanent essence in which they find refuge. But what does the Buddha say? This is from Majjhima 72 which is, if I'm not mistaken, is the Akiwachikota Sutta. Suppose a fire was burning in front of you. This is the Buddha, this wanderer, Akiwachikota. Suppose a fire was burning in front of you. Would you know that a fire was burning in front of you? If someone asked you what this fire burned in dependence on, how would you answer? You would answer that the fire was burning depending on the fuel of grass and sticks. If the fire was extinguished, would you know that the fire was extinguished? Yes. And in the document there, which we sent to you, I mentioned what the party word extinguished is. And this is not a philosophical statement. This is ordinary language, which any kid would understand. If the fire, the, the grass and stick fire was extinguished, the word they used was nibuto. It's a past participle, it's language and grammar. It means it nibbanad. Nibuto is the word related to nibbana. Nibbana is the, uh, the noun, what's it called? Uh, the noun which is, uh, connected to the past passport Nibuta. 
Well, I forget what the actual the, the grammatical term is now. But anyway, I think you understand what I'm saying. So if the fire had nibbarnered, would you know that the fire had nibbarnered? Yes. If someone then asked you where that fire went when it was extinguished, did it go to the east, the west, the north or south? How would you answer? And what you go to said, the question makes no sense. That fire burned in dependence on its fuel of grass and sticks. When that was used up, not getting any more fuel, it became extinguished. It didn't go anywhere. So too, where does an enlightened being go after death? Where does the chitta go after death of an enlightened being? This question makes no sense. It doesn't go anywhere. No more than a fire goes somewhere when it's extinguished. Okay, now I'm going to go on a bit. I always like going on. So we're going to go... on to the stream winner. So that's going down to page 27. Can you get that? The Sota partner or stream winning, stream enter. The Sota partner or stream enter, it's on my page 27. Have you got that? Yes, hopefully. Okay, here we go. This is from Majjhimanikaya 22. When you contemplate in this way, three fetters are abandoned in you. What are those three fetters? The view of a permanent essence, a soul if you like, or, an, uh, or a um, cosmic consciousness, or a um, uh, amateur jitter, that's all the, the feta of a permanent essence, a soul, whatever you wish to call it, even just original mind, that's part of the permanent essence. In other words, if you have a view of a permanent essence, that feta has not been abandoned in you yet, according to the Buddha. Skeptical doubt is feta number two, and belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. And those who have abandoned these three fetters are all stream winners, no longer subject to rebirth in the lower realm and headed for full enlightenment. But first of all, that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. And they gave some, some descriptions of those in the time of the Buddha. Remember, this was India. And some things in India don't change that much, especially some of the practices people have. So when the Buddha went and started traveling, he met these two people. And one was the, the one who'd taken on the, the rule of being a cow ascetic. And the other one was a dog ascetic. So both of them were on all fours. The cow ascetic hung out with fellow cows and just ate grass. And the dog ascetic hung out with dogs and just you know, ate what dogs ate. And they did that because it was a very tough and difficult thing to do a lot of pain and suffering. And they thought that meant they had a very strong mind, you know, to try and defeat their attachment to their body by doing these very harsh practices. Just like you have like the self mortification you know, in early Christianity. Sometimes they do it now as well. But anyway, so that self mortification, torturing their body, these two went up to the Buddha and said, what do you think of us? We've been doing this for such a long time. Is this a good practice? And the Buddha said, no. Said, what, 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 what will happen to us in our next lives? Will we be enlightened? Will we go to heaven? And the Buddha said, no. What will happen to us then? Well, you're the cow ascetic. In your future life, you'll be reborn as a cow. Or as a calf, to make it more accurate. And you, the dog ascetic, will be reborn as a puppy. That's what you got used to. And they weren't very happy with that. I think one of them gave up their asceticism 
and the other one just uh, disagreed with what the Buddha said and went off and just chewed the grass. <laughs> but anyhow, those are examples of like some of the things we do to think that just by doing a ceremony or just having rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. And even to this day, there's still people who do chanting. The thing as long as you keep chanting, 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 that that is enough to reach full enlightenment. I'm not going to name names, but you know what that group is. And of course, the Buddha says totally that that will not work. And of course, the doubt as well. Now, with that simile of doubt, that, that simile which I gave you earlier on the doubt of your path, the spiritual path and the meditation path, the simile of being lost up in the mountains in the mist is also very helpful to understand what the fetter of doubt really is, which stops you being a stream winner. So what one does, one's up in the mountains, lost in the mist, one just follows the stream, any old stream, because it goes downhill. In other words, you keep meditating, you keep practicing, you keep being kind, generous, forgiving, all the spiritual qualities which you know are going in the right direction. And this is the kindness, and you know that it leads to peace, it leads to more awareness, your mindfulness increases. And you can see, you can feel more, you're happier, you avoid obstacles, it's like the lights in your mind are increasing. To see a world and a grain of sand, a heaven and a wildflower. And to be able to do that, you know that you're going in the right direction, you see, carry on. And you'll get to this wonderful point when you're walking down the mountain in the mist, when amazingly fast, one minute you're in the mist and you're another few steps, you're underneath the mist. Once you're underneath the mist on top of the mountain, you can see everywhere. You can see the paths and the right down in the bottom, the little um, uh, houses where people live and the, the lock, you know, where you have to go walk in the road, you have to go to get back to the, the youth hostel. Everything is really clear. It may be a long way, but now you can see where your, your home is, and it's like a youth hostel. Once you get under the mist, that's where the doubt vanishes. You can see where you need to be, where you're going. And it's, one much, it's a wonderful experience of, yeah, I can see for myself now. You don't need to believe anybody, you don't need to argue with people, because you see for yourself. And you're underneath the mist, and your clarity of awareness is really, really, really strong. You don't have to believe. You just need to find out for yourself to get low enough down in order for you to be fixed. So, and the Buddha actually says these things, absolute rule over the earth, going to heaven, supreme sovereignty over all worlds. The fruit of stream winning surpasses them all. I really, really, really wanted to send that phrase over to Donald Trump so he can let go of being the unelected president. Absolute rule over the United States, going to heaven, supreme sovereignty over all worlds. That's nothing compared to being a stream winner. So you know, just let go and be a stream winner. And then you don't need to be in the White House anymore. What a wonderful thing that would be. Anyway, now that's describing just what the stream winning is. And what are the causes for that? This is from the, um, again, Majima 43. There are two conditions for the arising of right view. The word of another Aryan, another person who's at least a stream winner, and the work of the mind which goes back to the source. And those, it's a very short statement. But this is actually what happens, is the word of another enlightened being is important for anyone to become uh, enlightened themselves. Basically, the fact that your mind is cause and effect, and that because it is a process, not a being, you, know, you can't stop that process by yourself. That's impossible to do. What happens is somebody else teaches. 
or you may even read at the minimum requirement, maybe some suttas of the Buddha, some teachings and old texts, and something after a while just clicks in you. You, you can be honest enough, you might not agree with it first before you get right view, but be honest enough to see what the Buddha actually said. Or, you know, if you're with a great monk like an Ajahn Chah, well, he actually said, you don't have faith in it, but it really strikes you that this is really interesting. You haven't heard that before. When people ask, is there a soul, is there not a soul? And the Buddha said, both ideas are wrong, those are extremes. There's a process, and that's the process is what people take it to be, a soul. And when you see it clearly, it doesn't really deserve the word a soul, it's not permanent. It's just a cause and effect process, which goes on and on and on, one thing causing another. And if you want to know an example of that, one example which I like to give to people is that you always try and get nice, simple, um, simple similes. And this is the one of the, the mango. Because, you know, I like mangoes and it's nice to get into the end of the mango season here in Perth. But last week I had some really delicious mangoes, you know, locally grown. And there were, this is this time of the year. So anyway, that you eat a mango, mm, yummy. And after you eat the mango, you've got the seed. What do you do with the seed? You put the seed in the ground, you know, dig a little hole, put it in the ground and uh, cover it and just uh, let it germinate. Now you can't see this, but you know what happens. You've already been to biology class. You know that the seed splits and a little shoot comes up from that seed and pushes its way slowly and slowly and slowly till it gets to the, the uh, surface of the soil. And if you're watching, you can see a tiny little, like a bit of grass coming out of the ground. It's not grass, it's a shoot from the mango. And it goes up and up and up. And you soon know it's, it's not grass, but it looks like it at first, but you find its stem starts to, to get brown and starts to thicken up. It's like a little stick coming up. You know, it's a sapling. And that sapling takes quite a few years usually. That sapling grows thicker and thicker and thicker. And as it grows thicker, it gets taller, and then it might branch into what looks like a couple of shoots, and they eventually become branches as it grows and grows. And after a few years, you have a little tree. And once you have a little tree, you see the leaves come out, and maybe after a few years, you see little blossoms happening, little flowers coming on the end of every twig. And those blossoms, they get germinated, not germinated, pollinated, and then after they get pollinated, the base of those flowers starts to swell and you've got a little mango growing. And you see that mango, I remember doing this in Thailand, the food there was disgusting, but when the mango season came, you always look forward to that. You can see the flowers, you can see the, you see this on the trees and you think, oh, it's gonna be mango season soon. And then sometimes, you know what happened? The wind would come storms and they'd all, <laughs> they'd all get blown apart. I remember that year. No mangoes that year, or very few. But anyway, they're usually, without a big storm, they grow, 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 and then the mangoes are ready to eat. And when they fall, or when someone picks them, you eat them, mm, so delicious. And the question is, what goes from the first mango to the second mango you eat? It's not something going across or transferring, because every stage, which I described in brief, every stage, Nothing goes across, it's just things are transferred. In the, the DNA of the first mango, it's not the same as the DNA of the second mango. It's similar, there's always some mutations and changes. And even the molecules in the second mango are totally different than the molecules in the first mango. It's just like how the Buddha said, a stream of consciousness, where what you see under the bridge looks the same, but you know it's totally different water. That is like the process simile. So when you hear that from people, you say, well, that makes a bit of sense, hopefully. And that means that when you have the word of another and the work of the mind, which goes back to the source, this is where you don't go to see where a thing leads to, you go to its causes, the why, rather than the where to. And a nice little interesting point here and this was good old Fennel Bhikkhu Bodhi. He taught me this and I'll just always be very grateful to him for this. Now, what does actually the word Dhamma mean? 
And he said there are two words which like antonyms, opposite, like light and dark, like here and there. You know, two words which are opposites. And those two words were Dhamma and the word Atta, A-double-T-H-A. And Dhamma is where things come from, their causes. And Atta is where they lead, the consequences of them. So the idea of what you're looking at right now, what you're experiencing now, where does this come from? What is its causes? Why? And that investigation and empowering the mind to be able to perform that investigation through deep meditation. It's not just an intellect. It's not just having lots and lots of information. It's having the power of a still mind to stay with something long enough to really get into it and see it deeply. Just like seeing the world in a grain of sand again, the heaven in a wildflower. If your mind is tired, it hasn't got the strength, you, you can't see that. But when you practice meditation, your mind gets so powerful, it's amazing what you see. And anyway, so that's the work of the mind which goes back to the source. Together with the word another, you get these great teachings and a mind which is empowered. And then those are the main causes, those two of becoming a stream winner. And there are five factors that build on right view and take it to full enlightenment. Those are the factors of your virtue, which is not quite easy because when you get to these stages, who wants to break precepts? Who wants to be unkind? Who wants to steal or do any of these things which are against the precepts? So they are virtue, learning, where you increase your understanding you know, especially of the Buddhist teachings, and discussion. This is one of the reasons why you don't just teach the sutta. You invite questions afterwards. And that is one of the things which takes these things through to full enlightenment. It's not just um, study. It's having sort of good teachers around, hopefully enlightened teachers, who you can discuss with. So even though sometimes at the end of a session I get tired, I always feel that obliged to actually to be there to answer questions. If anybody said, nah, you just have faith in me, just believe me, and you don't need to ask questions, that is wrong. Even with Ajahn Chah, you, it was amazing that you could ask questions of him, any questions, and he would respect you for asking questions. And the only reason why that sometimes we can't fully answer the questions here is the time constraints, and that's something which I can't mess around with time. <laughs> half an hour is half an hour, and so there's stuff, stuff you can do in it. So I apologize for that. And stillness and insight, samatha vipassana. So those are the things which take it further. So it's your precepts. Your understanding by learning and discussing and your practice of meditation, your stillness and insight. Now, I'm carrying on with this. <coughs> this takes it a bit deeper, but I think it's worthwhile saying this. Fenwi Saka. This is the great, um, oh no, this is not the Fenwi Saka, the um, the lay person. This is, I think, a bhikkhuni or something, a bhikkhuni talking to a bhikkhu. One who is an Aryan cannot regard the body, experience, perception, will, or consciousness is any type of consciousness being the five candors, the components of existence. You cannot regard those as a permanent essence, nor a permanent essence as possessing any of these five components of existence nor any of the five components of existence, the five candors, as within a permanent essence, nor a permanent essence as within any of the five components of existence. That is how Sakaya Ditti, the person of you, is abolished. In other words, how you become a stream winner. And this is an explanation which is, um, it doesn't supplant what the Buddha said, but it makes it much clearer by using a simile. So one who is at least a stream winner does not regard the mind as a permanent essence. 
any type of mind. Like the flame and hue of a lamp. So you've got a, a light in those days, like a candle or an oil lamp. You don't regard the flame and the hue of the lamp, the color of the lamp is the same. Nor do you regard the mind as possessing a permanent essence. Like the mind is somehow bigger than a soul. And this mind, this chitta, is bigger, like a tree has a shadow. In other words, you look at the, uh, uh, instead of calling it permanent essence, let's call it soul. You don't regard the mind as possessing a soul, like a tree has a shadow. In other words, this mind, this jitter is really big, and the soul is just like this, how it's, it's um, um, shown to the world, like a tree has its shadow. Nor does regard the mind as within a soul. As so the soul is something really huge, most of it you cannot know, and the mind is inside of it. Some like a part of it, like a cosmic consciousness, and your consciousness is within it, just like the scent is within a flower. And it does not regard a permanent essence as within the mind, and not a soul as somehow inside your consciousness, like a jewel in a casket. And that was how the Buddha taught. Just all options, just knocking them off. So the only thing left is to understand that this mind is chitta, whatever it is, wherever it is, however it is, any type of size, cosmic or usual, is impermanent. Non-self, doesn't last. So um, I'm just going to go down a bit more because as usual, running out of time. So if you can go down a little one, one page to stream winning and a seven in the water simile. Now, this is very attractive for me because it's a very hot day today. You know, sometimes as monks, we're not allowed to go in the, the water, but you know, sometimes today, or just to soak off in the water, that'd be nice and cool off. It's not really appropriate to talk about this in England right now, which is really cold. Stream winning and a seven in the water simile. Very, very easy. There are these seven kinds of persons similar to those in the water. One who goes under and drowns. That means one with bad qualities. Number two, one who floats on the water and then drowns, meaning good at first, but then bad qualities dominate. And three, one who floats and keeps their head off water. I mean, the good qualities become ever stronger. And you can see these three are just human beings in this world. And some are just you know, quite bad from the very beginning. And they just don't get any spiritual growth. They drown in the world of the, the pleasures and the, the violence. Someone who sort of starts off floating, but then the bad qualities dominate. And the third one, one who floats and keeps their head above water. I mean, the good qualities become even stronger. They're good people. And fourth, the above, one who keeps their head above water because of their good qualities, and then who looks around and sees safety. They can see the shore. So one who sees the safety, they're in the water, now they can see the shore. That's called the stream enterer. In other words, you know where, where, where you're going and you know no doubt anymore. You've seen the shore, you've seen sort of the dry land where you can just re eventually rest and relax and, and just disappear. And number five, the above who is swimming to safety, I mean the once returner. These are the four stages of enlightenment. So you start off by seeing the shore and then of course you're going to try and get to that shore, you know, you can swim there. Then the fifth, the above, is they're swimming to the shore and they can feel solid earth underfoot. They're really close to the shore. And that's called the non-returner. And lastly, the above, who is safe on dry land. 
meaning the Arahat, the fully enlightened one, who has not yet Tyranibana disappeared. This is the enlightenment with the candles remaining. So those are the seven similes of the uh, people in the water. So it starts off your know, good quality, and your generosity, being a very good person is important. And then from eventually you can actually see where you need to go to get to safety. And that's just the, the, the view is straightened up. You've got really good ideas. You know what you need to do. And then you're on the way. Practicing meditation, uh, living a peaceful life, being kind, uh, keeping precepts, being generous, being forgiving, all those sorts of things. And you're a good person and you're on the way. And then soon you don't know really when. And so only you can actually you put your feet down. Hey, it's dry land under this. I'm pretty close now. And that's being like a, a non-returner. So close to enlightenment. And then from there, soon you're just walking on the shore. And at last you're sitting under the tree and a beautiful coconut tree. Having, if you like coconuts, find fresh coconut to drink. Or you find in some places that there's a nice little tea shop which sells good old breakfast tea with condensed milk. <laughs> or if you like old coffee, I don't know. <laughs> or you prefer coffee or whatever. In other words, you can relax and enjoy your time before you depart this existence forever. There's seven people in the water simile. Okay. So anyway, that's enough for today on the a few stories about uh, enlightenment, about uh, between two states of existence, a bit about the stream winner and what happens after being a stream winner. Okay, I hope that's good enough for you. Whatever, that's what you're gonna get. So I'll finish off now by the five minutes of uh, relaxation, going to the loo, having a break, and then afterwards we come back for the Q&A in five minutes time. Is that okay? Thank you, Ajahn, that's wonderful. Excellent, very good. Okay. I'm gonna mute myself.
Hi again. That was quick. We might want to wait another minute. I can see people are still yeah. settling in their, in their places. So we can start with the easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few questions about health actually related to this morning. Oh, good. Yeah, it's good. That's easy questions. Yeah. Uh, it's actually very important because yeah. this is people's personal reality of now. And becoming enlightened is maybe a bit too far in the future. Who knows? Great. So let's see. There's a lot of questions, so we'll do our best. Okay. Shall we start? No, let's wait for another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, let's start. <laughs> okay. So this person saying, I love your stories of hope for recovery for physical and mental disorders and feel a bit of a failure and question my practice when I listen to that. Because after years of battling post-traumatic stress disorder related severe anxieties, her mother was severely mentally ill and committed suicide, mm. getting help with therapy and attending many retreats and practicing daily meditation, I've started to get mild anti-anxiety medication and it's changing my yeah. life. Excellent. But my meditation and giving me so much more clarity, peace and ability to cope with emotion. What is your view on medical treatment for severe anxiety or depression for practicing Buddhists? No problem. I have to take medication every afternoon. That's my cup of tea, which is again another drug. It's another medication. It's something which is more common because I got used to it and I enjoy it. I sometimes I've gone cold turkey for remember, three months deciding because I was challenged by other monks are oh, you addicted to it I said no I'm not yes you are no you're not yes I am whatever it was <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I went I went without tea for three months easy so you had a nice, nice time but no if the medication works fine because sometimes your brain there's some sort of chemicals in it which need to be balanced and that's all that is so if that's happening just please take it and for goodness sake please please never feel that you're a failure in life there is no such thing as a failure in life. Just when you make a mistake, that's where we learn. If you didn't make any mistakes, if I never, uh, if I was af afraid of being a failure, I never would have done anything. I would never given any talks, never sort of set up a monastery, never ordained bhikkhunis, because mm -hmm. you'd be afraid, oh, what if I get fail? What if people criticize me? They criticize me anyway. You do it, you don't do it, you still get criticized. So you just do it and just have fun. And don't worry about being a failure in life. You learn, it's growth. So I don't really even understand what the word failure means or success. It's an adventure. And if this path doesn't work, you just go another path and find that and go another path. You learn so much in life and it's good fun. Lovely, thank you, Ajahn. Um, Hiranti is asking, can you please advise how to keep the breath longer in the present moment? You don't keep the breath long in the present moment. The present moment is just here. The present moment is not long or short. The present moment is just here. So when you don't do anything, then you learn how not to control things, leave things alone, and not to measure. Remember that thing I said yesterday? It is actually, <laughs> when I first heard this, I thought, wow, I've heard something similar to this from the third Zen patriarch. This is Mahayana and I'm a Theravada, but nevertheless, whenever you see something really beautiful and wise, you know, you accept it, repeat it. And then this third Zen patriarch said that uh, the, the path, especially the path of meditation is easy. People have no preferences. When I first heard that, I thought, wow, that's really deep and powerful. We have good meditations, bad meditations, long meditations, short meditations. This is good, this is not good. That is where 
you create the stress in meditation, disturb everything. Stop measuring. Because when you don't measure, you can't control. When you don't control, I mean, I mean, really, it doesn't mean go out of control. It just, you let it be. And that becomes so powerful. I'm not measuring. I'm not saying pleasurable, unpleasurable, long or short, in this moment, just now. To be able to measure, you need something to compare it to. In other words, the past. To control means you've got some plan for the future. In the meditation, you have none of that. No past, no future, really in this moment. And you just you can't measure. Imagine you can't even measure yourself. Ajahn Brahm, good meditator, bad meditator. I don't know, I'm not there anymore. So that's where you have so much freedom. It's achieving, non-achieving, attaining, non-attaining, all that disappears. So there is no uh, success or failure when you leave the present, leave the past and future behind. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, there's a question about this morning's talk about using mindfulness and kindness to overcome sickness. How can we adapt this to help a young woman suffering from PS, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder after a rape? Okay, how you do that? I'm going to take a bit more time here. Please excuse me, because this was a wonderful story where I got invited to an organization in Perth a few years ago called the Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. And it's not people survive not even a single rape, but many rapes, torture in these underground dungeons in many places in the world. And somehow or other, they physically survived. But mentally, emotionally, they were still back in those torture chambers and underground dungeons. And first of all, it's just unbelievable they could physically survive what was inflicted on them. And just the sort of things which human beings can do on one another is just, it is really hard for me to, to, to embrace, not to embrace, to understand. But anyway, but so what they did, they invited me there and I wondered why. And it's because they'd come to our temple over in Perth and they'd learned how to, are very successful, it doesn't always work, but it works for so many of them. People are subject of trauma or rape. What they do is that when they feel reasonably safe, obviously they've got, you've got to feel comfortable before you meditate, that no one's going to come and beat you or abuse you which is why that's why these people who are counselors, therapists, good nuns, good monks, after a while, you feel so safe with them. You feel so accepted. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to protect anything. And then they sit down, they do this little meditation of closing their eyes, relaxing their body enough. And then they imagine in their chest a heart like a Valentine's Day heart. And they imagine that heart has two doors, double doors. And they imagine those two doors opening. And it usually takes much more time than this. I'm just going over it in brief. Those two doors open up. And inside is the person they feel comfortable with, the person they feel safe with, the times and the memories which weren't traumatic the love and kindness and, and happiness and laughter in their life. That person is inside. They look outside and outside of their heart, on the concrete, on the ground, in the cold, in the rain, unloved, unaccepted, is that little girl who was raped, little boy who was just beaten for no reason, the person who was tortured just because they wanted to fight for some sort of freedom in their country. All those parts of you are outside, alone, rejected. And you imagine a ladder coming down from your heart in which you're looking, down on the ground. And you call out to that little girl who was you. Say, come up. I'm not going to keep you out or try and get rid of you anymore. 
come up, come in. When they describe what they do, it makes me emotional, beautiful emotions. You can imagine what happens. This memory of you when you were just so abused. It takes a lot of encouragement and fear for you to bring this inside of yourself. When that little being comes into your, your heart, your arms entwine around each other, you hug one another, so I won't keep you out ever again. You're part of me, you're who I am, you're my history. And then when you find these women who told me this, mostly women, they say once they accept that terrible thing, which happened to them. It's a, a catharsis happens, a change. So they're no longer afraid. And that trauma of the past, it doesn't disappear, but it no longer hurts. They're no longer ashamed. They feel no more stigma. They're one again. Which is in brief. Close my eyes, because just imagine what these women would saying to me. It's really inspiring. It all came from that little story, opening the door of your heart. And it was just extended, taken further than I'd ever expected. Because you know, I've had a very mild, very happy life. No real much trauma. But anyway, people who have, if you feel safe and comfortable, try that. And if it's okay for you, you don't feel pressured you feel that you want to give this a go and with lots of kindness and sense of safety give it a go and see what happens thank you Ajahn. okay beautiful okay so someone's asking how to be kind to physical pain or the body when one feels depressed or emotionally exhausted and cannot generate any warm fuzzy feelings in the heart You get an assistant. <laughs> you know, that's why I just have little bears around the place. <laughs> Some people think I jump has gone crazy. If you come to my retreat center, there's a whole heap of bears. It started with one bear, which we bought out from Ajahn Sujata. And then from there, I don't know what happened at night time. Maybe they're not keeping the eight precepts because they're procreating or something. We've got hundreds of bears in there, teddy bears in our retreat center. And I can see one of them on the shelf behind me, uh, behind Venal Chanda, sorry. And those bears are just a wonderful, easy way of generating some warmth. You know, just they're really soft, they're non threatening. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to do anything with them except just to cuddle them. And you feel this beautiful warmth. That's how you can generate warmth. And even if you've got very small amount of energy, it's as if you're covering that, it's giving you safety, warmth, and it creates an opportunity to, to, to light the fires of kindness inside of you. Even when you're depressed, the energy, the low energy of depression, is just relieved. That good energy comes up, and you've got this wonderful kindness. You know, sometimes when people are really sick, in a hospital depressed, sometimes it just takes one other person to smile at you, to be kind to you, and to even just to you know, give you uh, a tap on the shoulder or something. That little acts of kindness, they mean so much, and they're small. They generate something much bigger. And so because it's difficult to touch people these days, or even smile at them, because people think, what the heck are you up to? Especially religious figures, so unfortunately. So you have little teddy bears, and teddy bears have never been sued for, for malpractice. <laughs> so, so teddy bears are safe. Now get yourself a nice teddy bear and start with that. And I think you'll probably notice it makes a huge difference, which you never expected, and it's so simple to do. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, so someone's asking, my house plant never moved its big leaves. Yesterday, something moved its leaves with a bang and it broke my meditation. Can a supernatural thing break our peace? Thank you, Venerable Ajahn and Chanda. These are the best days of my life. Yay. 
that sometimes supernatural things can occur, but they're usually something else. You know, it's just the time that leaf had to fall or the wind blows it or something knocks it. But sometimes, you know, I've seen that, and as a theoretical physicist, you have no other explanation, it's something sort of supernatural. But even if it is supernatural, a ghost or something, you are more powerful than ghosts. So you can actually tell that supernatural being, be quiet, shut up, stop disturbing my meditation. Scold any supernatural powers who try and disturb you. They're making bad karma. <laughs> and and if, if they don't listen to you, just in your mind, tell them that you just made some very bad karma. I'm going to tell Ajahn Brahm about you. Ah, no, oh, please, sorry, I'll never do it again. <laughs> Um, it's not such so much a joke. That's actually quite true. What happens that sometimes there are some beings who play around, and most people can't hear them. But if you do hear them, just tell them to be quiet. You're meditating. You don't okay. need to let them disturb you. Yeah. Okay. This question is: uh, What is the balance between being kind to others, hoping to nourish the good in them? with love and kindness and being kind to ourselves when the outside hurts, especially with extremely difficult people who continuously hurt us. Aren't we being unkind to ourselves if we're kind to them against our peace? Yes. So they have this wonderful saying, to love the tiger at a distance. <laughs> In other words, you've got somebody who's causing you a lot of stress and unhappiness and then give them, send them love, but not right up next to them. Otherwise they'll bite you and they'll hurt you. And also make sure you've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of love inside of you. So you can actually give something. A lot of people try and make all beings be happy and well. That's a lot of beings you're sharing your, your energy with. Ask yourself, have you got enough energy to share with others? So instead of just going share, may all beings be happy and well, look at your poor little self and say, oh, may I be happy and well, and give yourself a good hug. You know, it's the other thing which a monk is not allowed to do, to hug people. For two reasons, because, you know, sexual abuse allegations, if I hug someone, you know, they'll probably get a court order against me. And also in COVID time, you've got to have social distancing, so you can't sort of you know, hug anybody. You might catch something. So instead of hugging people, I worked out this wonderful way where everyone can get a good hug with no allegations of sexual abuse, no catching of anything you haven't already got. That is putting your hands out, bringing them in and hugging yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I do that, give myself a hug and I really get into it not just putting your hands and just thinking, oh, this is something silly, really getting into it and giving yourself a good hug. And just really close and just warm and just up and down. <coughs> okay, you might not like to try that on camera, but if you want to sort of uh, put your camera off for a few minutes and give it a try, it actually feels good. And it's also an act of self-love, being kind to yourself. And an act rather than a thought. Thoughts are great, but the acts are much more powerful. So that's <coughs> how you can do that, how you can start giving yourself some kindness and some love. Okay. All right, lots of questions coming in, but there's a couple of fairly quick ones. Um, is it possible to receive transmission of word of another by listening to an Aryan on YouTube or in a Zoom room? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Okay. The next one is the mind consciousness is in the brain. Some say the consciousness is in the heart. I find this confusing. Thank you. No, the mind consciousness is not in the brain. Otherwise, when you're dead, you wouldn't be able to get reborn. <coughs> so the brain is just, it's been given too much prominence in science. And the people like the people without a brain were still alive. 
a wonderful article from Professor John, John Lauber, Sheffield University, it's a while ago now, but he was uh, doing research into the shape of human skulls and found this boy, he was an honors, he was a graduate in mathematics doing masters, so a brilliant fellow, and he had a girlfriend, he was just looked so normal except his, his head was a bit distorted, a bit thin. No one else noticed that, but the professor noticed that and asked him to join the research and gave him a, a CT scan of his brain and found he had no brain in there. It was the boy without a brain. And it had like a 1% cortex so just on the outside and then just cerebral fluid in the rest of his brain. And that's never, never in any way enough to explain how a person can have a girlfriend, um, <coughs> I'll be able to speak, be able to a great student in mathematics and be so-called normal on the outside. And I remember just going to Sydney once and just talking about these things. And one of the doctors there, he was a Buddhist and he said, yeah, I've seen that CT scan. It was done several times because they too thought there was something wrong with the machine. It's real, he said. And he said, he turned around to me and said, look, Ajahn Bhav, you wouldn't believe how much problem that is giving to neuroscience. Because it's real, it happened, and it just totally challenges what neuroscientists think. And what happened to it, it was just put in the anomaly, um, the anomaly tray, and not really taken any further. So this is like consciousness without a brain. And of course, it happens when people have near-death experiences floating out of their brain. What happens when people die and they remember their past lives? What happens under hypnosis when you may have some uh, some great trauma to your brain? The brain, the memory's been knocked away or thrown out of the brain. But under hypnosis, you can remember it. So the brain is not where the mind is. Where is the mind? Okay, here we go. The, this is my friend uh, who's had a daughter and first year at school in UK. It was a grade one or year one, whatever you call it these days. And teacher asked the question, what is the biggest thing in the world? And one kid put her hand up immediately. You know what grade one kids are? They're just so enthusiastic. My father is the biggest thing in the world, said one kid. No, 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 no. An elephant is much bigger than your father. No, no, no. A mountain is the biggest thing in the world. They all had this biggest thing in the world ideas. And the daughter of my friend, so my eye is the biggest thing in the world. And everyone stopped at that. It's absolutely brilliant. My eye is the biggest thing. I said, how come? I said, because my eye can see her daddy, can see a mountain, can see an elephant and so much more. If all of that can fit into my eye, my eye must be the biggest thing in the world. Pretty good, but not complete. Because your mind can see everything your eye will ever see. And it can imagine things you'll never see in the real world. It can hear, smell, taste, touch, and has its own field of knowledge. In fact, everything you can ever experience or will ever experience can fit into your mind. So your mind is the biggest thing not in the world, because the world can be experienced in your body. So, that's the biggest thing in the world, the mind. It doesn't exist in the body. The body exists in the mind. And that's one of the reasons why people can mess around with their health for positive reasons. The body is in your mind, not the other way around. Okay. Okay. There's loads of questions from people who haven't really asked at all during this retreat. So um, okay. we might have to come here. try and get them all in. So um, someone's asking about that simile where the uh, flame goes out. Oh, yeah. So they're saying that um, in nature, the fire does go somewhere because it transforms into ashes and smoke. So it is a transformation, not an end. How does this tie in with enlightenment? Is enlightenment then a transformation of such? No, the fire is not the ash or the smoke. That's the fuel being combusted. So the actual the flame itself is the 
the image of the combustion occurring, giving off heat. But the flame is not the heat. And this is like, where does it go? Where does it come from? Where does it go? And so it comes from a fuel. And when the fuel is exhausted, the flame disappears. Where did it come from? You might say it came from the mat, but you know, that's just passing the buck, kicking the can back down the road of time. In other words, this is a phenomena, a light. And when the fuel disappears, so does the light disappear. You are that light. When the fuel vanishes, especially the fuel of wanting something, the desire, craving, when that fuel is exhausted, so are you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next question is the assumption of a me just the accumulation of worldly worldly experiences in this life? Yeah, well, it's a bit simplistic to say it's accumulation of worldly experience. It's something which we've assumed, something which we've been told is right, something which we use to get by in life. So that, you know, when they ask, you know, that when you go to see the doctor, say, what's your name, show us your cards and stuff. All this stuff, which we identify with, our passport, our name, our gender, our age, our whatever, all those things. After a while, you look at those things and, is that really me? Of course it's not. Now, I've got a degree, but I, I, I've forgotten most of it by now. So really, I shouldn't really call myself uh, a graduate. <laughs> I've never passed anything these days. <laughs> So we're like, who are you? And oh, okay. That I here we go. I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this. Sorry, but I'll try to <laughs> get as many questions answered as possible. But last year, a year ago, I went to uh, I went on it online because I'm getting old now, and I thought I can get a, uh, a Commonwealth Commonwealth of Australia um, elderly people senior people's card. And I didn't really need one. I thought, well, well, I can, so why not? And so I found out that, yeah, I qualified for one, but I had to go into the offices to actually to get approved because they were thinking it might be identity fraud. So I made an appointment. I went into the local um, social security office. They called it Centre Care in Australia. I went in, they made the appointment. And uh, there's a lady, very nice lady. I sat in front of her and said, oh, we called you in because you have to prove you know, who you are, who are you? And I said, you know, being Ajahn Brahm, I said, I've been a monk for 46 years and for 46 years, I've been trying to find out who I am. And she didn't think that was funny. <laughs> Sometimes my jokes fall very flat. But anyway, she said, no, look, I need ID, okay? So show us your driving license. I said, I'm a monk, I don't have a driving license. Oh, okay, well show us your, your um, house ownership. I oh, know your bank card, first of all. Show us your credit card. I said, don't have one of those. Your bank accounts, no, I don't have a bank account. Don't have money in any bank. Your pension card, I don't have any pension. Your uh, place where you live card. I said, uh, I know, I live in a cave, but I don't own it. And I said, well, your rental agreement. I don't have a rental agreement. I don't pay any rent for a place where I stay. And they asked all these questions. I didn't have any of these documents. And they even asked, and this is no joke, they even asked, show us your marriage certificate. <laughs> I said, I don't have a marriage certificate. And all the usual pieces of paper, which you usually have to prove your identity, I don't have. I'm a monk. And this poor lady got really upset. and said, well, you know, basically you don't exist. And according to social security, according to the government, that's true. I don't exist. And I said, yay, the Buddha was right. I don't exist. And she got upset at me again. I said, look, this is serious. I've got work to do. But fortunately, I had two passports, a British passport and an Australian, and an Australian passport. I said, well, I'm not really supposed to accept this, but this is good enough. So she gave me my seniors card. But it's so hard for a monk to prove who they are. Because we don't exist. Yay. <laughs> so who are you? After a while, you find all those cards, the bank accounts, the details, your achievements, your failures, all of those. That's not who you are. 
Anyway, I better carry on with some questions, otherwise I can go on talking for too long. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to ask for advice on how to balance taking meta and compassion into daily life and work without being taken advantage of or being seen as a pushover. Okay. Uh, when I do marriage ceremonies, just in brief, I look at the bride and said, right, you're now a married woman. From this day on, you must not think of yourself. Yes, she agrees. Look at the, the new husband. From this day on, you must not think of yourself. He says yes to. Still looking at the husband. I say, from now on, you must not think of your wife, the girl sitting, standing next to you. And quickly, I look, turn to the wife and say, same for you. From this day on, you must not think of your, your husband. And they get really confused. And I love that moment. I tell them, once you're married, you must not think of yourself, nor must you think of your partner. Once you're married, you must only think of us, the third option. Giving it together. And that third option, people usually miss that. If you're in a relationship, so often you get burnt out because you're always thinking of what you need to do for your partner. And some people, they're just so self-centered. You only think, what's in it for me? But it's not about you. It's not about them. It's always about us. Life is a relationship. So when you're with other people, it's not just serving them. Otherwise, you do get burnt out. But it's about us. You're in it together. So that third option answers, answers the question. That way you don't get burnt out. Okay, next question. Okay. Sometimes during the past practice of sitting meditation, I feel like my arms are extremely long and solid like a rock. It's not unpleasant, but I wonder what's happening to me. Do you know what's going on and if it's normal? Yeah, it's normal and it's great. It's good fun. What's happening is that it's like a rock, which means it's still great. It, it feels like it's getting long. What happens here is it's like your perception is getting some freedom. It's like when a person first leaves home and goes to university or goes to work, yay, they're free. And a lot of time the kids just mess around, they play around, and, yeah, I'm free from mum and dad, I can do whatever I want. And they do that for a couple of weeks and then they get back to work again. But it's like that you, your control over your body and your perceptions has been lessened. And now you can view your body as all sorts of things. It's good fun, you don't have to be afraid. And then after a while, just enjoying that for a little while, and then your body comes back to normal again, unfortunately. So it is just your perception is playing around. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's good fun, because it's only temporary. Just see how, see how fat your, your arm can become and how long it can become. Just really go for broke and have good fun. It's totally safe, perfectly normal. During meditation, I'm focusing my attention on the breath or the body and sometimes negative emotions or compulsions come up. Should I continue focusing on the body or the breath and let the negative emotions fall away or let these negative emotions come to the center and try and understand them? See what the body and mind wants to do. So you don't make any choice. In other words, if you're watching there and a negative emotion comes up, a lot of time the body or the mind will decide, nah, not interested it'll just disappear. Or if it does come up to you, it does take center stage, then it's obviously important and see if you can learn something from it. There's nothing wrong with negative emotions. If you've sort of got some fear or something, or fear is a bit more difficult to deal with, but if it's like boredom, then ask yourself, what actually is boredom? Have you ever actually investigated boredom? Boredom is a very fascinating subject. Is it sort of appearing on your body? Where does it appear on the body? How does it feel on the body? What's it like when it's on the body? How long does it last? Does it change? Where does it come from? Where does it go to? Boredom becomes fascinating, which means it's not boring anymore. <laughs> it's a way to overcome boredom. There was sort of an investigation into it. A little bit, and have a bit of fun as well in your meditation. Just be a bit, um, a bit rebellious, innovative. Yeah. Okay. Ajahn, please could you say something on how having wrong view, particularly on consciousness, as you mentioned today, uh, can, affect, can affect meditation or the practice of right mindfulness? 
how it affects meditation especially is because you have a sense of self you get fear strong fear when things start to disappear and that fear blocks you somehow or other teachers like myself have to somehow trick you encourage you just uh, somehow take your hand and lead you there's nothing to be afraid of because there's nothing to be be harmed at all to take you away from that into this beautiful bliss of freedom and emptiness and but if you have a strong sense of self and of course when these things start to disappear it's like yourself is vanishing and of course that is one of the scariest things in the world so because of that that's one of the big problems if you uh, haven't got enough understanding of non-self you've got nothing to lose there's no one there so just relax and let go Otherwise, people can only let go so much. Okay. Yeah. From Matt, um, does the process simile fit our full understanding of the stream of consciousness? E.g., does it have a start? Can it branch off? Ah, now starts. I think I mentioned that the other day. I think on this, that you know the starts, beginnings, like the creation idea. None of that ever makes any sense to me because, you know, what was before the creation? So instead of having starts, just re-understand really your concept of time. And the idea that flat earth, in the old days, if you go far enough, you come to the end of the planet earth or the beginning of it, you fall off the edge. And space, thinking that space is flat, but you know, all physicists know it's curved. This space has got a certain volume. There's only so much space in our universe, but there's no beginnings and ends of it. We all like to think that planet Earth is the center of the universe. That's what people used to think. But we know it's just like a, a pretty ordinary, insignificant, not very uh, amazing uh, end of a spiral of one of the ordinary galaxies in one of the ordinary parts of the universe. We're not special at all. I like that part of science, where it, just, it takes away our sense of importance. But anyway, this universe is just curved. So in other words, whichever way you go from here, if you leave um, sort of June Street in Oxford and go in a straight line, after a few uh, billions of years, <laughs> you'll end up straight back in June Street if it's still there. In other words, this universe is curved. It's got no beginning or end, but it's limited volume. You get your head around that, and then you understand about time. Time, no beginning or end, but limited size. Okay. And just like expanding universe, I like expanding time. So just imagine, it's a pretty much a, a very gross approximation. Imagine it's like a loop. It keeps on expanding. So it means you never get around one loop but it's not, no beginning, no end. Okay. okay. There's at least yep. another five or six, I mean, there's many, many questions. Maybe well, well, keep, keep okay. asking, we'll just, when okay. we run out, we run out. Okay, all right. Um, the Buddha was elaborating clearly why there's no permanent essence, but nowadays I think it's more common to believe in annihilation that comes with the end of life or death. How does the Buddha refute that? Oh, because it's not that hard to remember your previous lives. The evidential support of that. There's many people who can remember their previous lives. Then you just need one person. If just one person has been reborn, then that totally destroys the idea of annihilation. If one, why not many? Why just one person? can remember their previous lives? And this is not just a memory of, of being some crazy person. This is real hard memories, which are validated. People check up on these and they find actually this person actually existed in the past. There's too much evidence against the annihilation of a human body and a human mind. These five candles, five components of existence ceasing when a person dies. Haven't anybody actually experienced a ghost, a person who's died? And actually just, now there, 
the body's gone. The mind is, stream of consciousness is still happening. What the heck is going on? There's far too much evidence to show that this consciousness, stream of consciousness, is not the brain and survives the death of the brain. So it's just the supporting evidence is far too strong to even think the idea that you can have just this one life and suddenly it ceases. Unless you're enlightened. So Dill's asking, from today's teachings, being mindful in the present moment and practicing kindness and stillness is a priority over experiencing arising and passing away? Aha! Experiencing arising and passing away. This is from Satipatthana. And it does not mean what most people think. Just have a look in the um, Nidana Samyutta, how the Buddha described what is the arising and passing away. It's, it's in my manuscript. Word of the Buddha somewhere, you find it's what means arising and passing away is what is the cause of things like the body? What is the cause of Vedana, this uh, experience, the feeling? What is the cause of the, the mind, the jitta? Why does the mind come into existence? And what causes it to cease? And those are what the Buddha meant, Udaya, and uh, what is it uh, arising and Atagamana. Atagamana, yes. And that's actually what it really means. It's not rise and fall, like things coming up and going down. It's much more refined than that. It's what causes it to, to come into existence. So all of those Satipatthanas, you're supposed to see what causes these things. That's the Yonis of Manasikara. The why did this mind arise in this moment? Why did this feeling arise? What causes it? And once you know the cause, you know the, how to cease it, or how it ceases. Okay. So, a question on the jhanas here. Um, the German nun Aya Kemar said in her talks about the jhanas that the Buddha said it's possible to go from each jhana to another intentionally and not necessarily in sequence. And by her teachers in this tradition, I was advised to train in this. She also said that there's an observer in all the jhanas and in the first ones, the body and senses have not completely vanished. For me, that's very contrary to your description, so I'm quite confused. Are there different opinions, perceptions, or understandings of the jhanas? I'll be grateful if you can clarify this. Thank you. Yes, of course, there are different perceptions of and understandings of the jhanas, but I am following the suttas. This is wiwichehi kamehi, wiwicha akusalehi damehi, wiwichehi kamehi means separated from, apart from, secluded from, the five senses. And the word karma, K long A M A, in the plural, always refers to the senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. This is when those five senses have turned off. So there is no um, sense for a five sense experience in the first jhana, or second jhana, or third jhana, or fourth jhana. And that's how the, the, how the Buddha described it. And is it the case then that she's saying here that the Buddha said it's possible to go from each jhana to another intentionally and not necessarily in sequence? Intentionally means that you make a determination. But there has to be the sequence, simply because these things are parts of the first jhana. From there to the other jhanas, parts of the first jhana are falling away. To get into the second jhana, something is missing in the first, the second, the second to the third, third to the fourth. And I haven't seen the Buddha actually saying you go from one to the other, missing ones. Even in this Mahaparinibbana Sutta, where the Buddha, just Anuruddha was checking out if the Buddha is still alive could read the mind enough to say, go from one to two to three to four, then to the Arupas, and then back again to four. What in sequence. Okay. Uh, okay. There's quite a few about practice, which I think would be nice if we can. Okay, so someone's asking, um, referring to the Anapanasati Sutta, the ninth step, 
experiencing the mind, the word chitta pati samvedi is used, but no reference to the nimitta. Are there any yeah. references in the suttas that this step in fact refers to a nimitta? You're experiencing the chitta. So what is the chitta? How do you experience it? The nimitta means a sign of the chitta. In other words, how can you experience a chitta? How can you experience a human being without seeing what is a human being? What is a sign of a human being? Mostly it is a body. When people have passports, they have the facial features in the passport. They don't have pictures of their foot in the passport. Why don't they put people's feet in the passport? Because you can probably distinguish one person's foot from another person's foot, but we get so visually con conscious of our faces, that becomes a sign of who we are. That is the limiter of the human body, which we use in passports. We have done for many, many years. So the limiter of the mind, the way you usually experience it, is through a limiter. Limiter means a sign. Yes, there are, I mentioned this, there can be sort of uh, uh, audio signs, audio limiters, beautiful sounds like people here just chanting and it's not happening. It's just in the mind, it's just gorgeous chanting. Or sometimes they, they can smell gorgeous fragrances in the meditation hall. And they realize they're not actually smelling this with the, the nose. It's an imitator appearing in their mind. It's not real. It's beautiful, gorgeous, and it's stable coming at the end of, uh, of a very quiet meditation. That is actually how we experience the jitter, the mind, when it starts to seclude itself, uh, taken away from the five senses. And you can actually have a look at the Upaklesa Sutta and see if you can scrub out all the times that Bhikkhu Bodhi says, you see, that lit thing or that light and put in limiter, and it will become very clear to you. Okay. Not just once, it's about you know, 16 times the limiter is mentioned. Okay, so in today's meditation, I went back and forth in stages where my body and then breath started to disappear, but then came back again. This happened continuously and I finally came out of the meditation. Can you please advise? It's wonderful, you're getting some, some peace. So don't rush it, don't want things. Because somehow you got so peaceful and you're getting sort of things disappearing. Why couldn't you go deeper? Why couldn't you even just stay there? It's because, you know, I've got to be very careful when I teach the deeper meditations because people hear about this and they want it. And it's usually that is the fear or wanting stops you going deeper. So I'd advise you to or recommend the body starts to disappear. Just say, oh, this is wonderful. This is good enough for me. I don't need to go any deeper. I'm so happy with this. And then you go deeper and you don't want to. In other words, when the wanting is not the obstacle for you anymore. So often that this is all, oh, there's early days of meditation. I would have similar uh, blockages. You get really quite deep in meditation, but that's as far as you could go. And so I'd reflect, what was the obstacle? Why, you know, what was the problem? There's always I could see I wanted something, very refined things. But when I noticed that afterwards, this is what I wanted. I wanted to get into the jhana. I wanted to get an imitator. That wanting was the problem. And as soon as I became just content and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature, and just so happy just to have a nice little peaceful meditation, it didn't have to be nimitas or jhanas, that's fine. I just really content just to be here and relax. And then of course the obstacles were removed. And then it becomes a natural progression. You can't resist it. Thanks. Because you wanted something. Find out what you wanted. Okay. Um, in deep meditation, I felt some kind of visitors from outside. It was nice and I felt very grateful. Now I wonder if our minds are really private. Yeah, of course they're private. You can always say no if you don't want any visitors. You can make a resolution, no thank you. And if you are in deep meditation and 
you get sort of some uh, perceptions which are not just of stillness. Things are actually happening. It can't be the jhanas. It's usually the nimitta stages. But in the jhanas, you don't have any visitors. You can't. It's this type of bliss which is very, very calm and still. And unchanging for a long time. Okay. Do we have another five minutes, do you think? Yes, yes, come on, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. energized, yeah. Okay, super. Uh, how to recognize the border where I'm mindful, kind, and letting go, and when I cross that line and start wanting to let go, and how yeah. to be kind without doing it? Yeah, after a while, you can actually say, I'm going to be kind. That's doing it. But then listen to the echo afterwards. And the echo has not got the intentions anymore. It's like shooting an arrow you need to aim. But then once the arrow's in flight, you don't need to aim anymore. So if you understand that, you give the instructions, and then you shut up. And you wait for a long time. You don't sort of just make another instruction straight away. Then you find you have this kindness. And it's without sort of any wanting. Okay. Rob's asking, how important is it to be part of a Buddhist community? Uh, it's helpful. You don't have to be. You may be, Rob might be one of these Pacheka Buddhas. <laughs> In other words, just a solitary enlightened being. So it's nice to be part of it, to share. And sometimes you get lots of support. Sometimes you get... Um, some encouragement. So that's a good thing to do. But it's not absolutely necessary. Okay. okay. Pedro is saying that when meditating in the middle of a 10 day retreat, something happened. He opened his eyes and realized that he was the only one in the hall, meaning that he didn't realize the others had left at some point. Right after this, he felt a lot of energy, which stayed for days and manifested while dancing tango, while suddenly I was able to perform steps that I could not before. Since then, I felt like 15 kilos disappeared from my shoulders. What was this? Oh, that was, that obviously, the, your hindrances sort of really started to disappear. And, and I don't know, that might have been a jhana. From what you expected, that's some of the uh, results of having a jhana, is you don't hear sounds, so you don't hear other people get up and go, and you're just right there, and you've just lots of energy, lots of bliss. And it's amazing, just your body, just, you know, your body is limited by your perceptions. And sometimes after good meditation, it's like those limits which you thought you had aren't really there. You can do things. Like dance a tango. I've got no personal experience of that, I must admit. <laughs> but I can see how it works. I've often said that sometimes if you, a person gets into a deep meditation afterwards, even at my age, you, know, you think you can just compete with uh, Usain Bolt in the 100 meters Olympics. With all this incredible energy. I'm an old monk, I'm fat. So there's no way I could compete with Usain Bolt in 100 meters, but nevertheless, you get this <laughs> good energy and positive, and you think you can. And who knows, you can probably run much faster than most people think. Okay. Great. Um, dear Ajahn, is right intention a practice in itself? Sometimes it seems to me that I try to have right intention, but I end up getting tense. So I don't get the intention always right. But fortunately, I can practice to do so and cultivate right intention and gradually learn yeah. more. Because any one of these parts of the Eightfold Path, they need the other ones to support them. So if you really want to get the, the right intention, I call it right motivation. Just the motivations of letting go motivations of kindness, motivations of gentleness. But you have to, you know, to really make those strong, have some right view. To really make them really work, it makes it quite easy when you start to keeping your precepts. You realize that right intention is what makes right the precepts. Some are, um, some are wajah, some are kamanta, some are ajiwa, makes them very easy. And of course, once you have uh, intentions of letting go and kindness and gentleness, that becomes renunciation. And then once you have renunciation, the Satipatthana is just obvious and uh, automatic. And then you get stillness. 
So you can actually start any one of those, but it, the other ones are brought in line with it as well. It's just one aspect of one path. Okay. Yeah. One more? Two more? Yeah, go on. Yeah, well, let's try <laughs> one and see. Okay. Uh, from Fabrizio, why is it that to me it seems that sitting doing nothing is much more effective than watching the breath? Maybe watching the breath, I carry some wanting or ill will or controlling that I can avoid simply doing nothing. Great, yeah. I'd, I'd approve of that, Fabrizio, to sit there doing nothing. And you know, if the breath comes, the breath comes. You don't choose to do it. It just comes and visit you. Hey, Fabrizio, how are you going? The breath coming here. Yeah, I can be with you for a while. So you don't do it. In fact, doing nothing is pretty impossible. So I don't call it doing nothing. I call it nothing doing. Stop doing stuff. I think that's what you mean. But of those two, I'd, you know, I'd encourage you to do nothing. Hmm. Okay. Um, another question just came in. Uh, with regards to bad beings causing problems, can they can take control of the body? How do you know the difference between this and energy movement in the body? Well, there are no such thing as bad beings. It's just beings who do stupid things. <laughs> so not bad. <laughs> They're just a bit deluded. But those beings, they can't really get into your body. It's very, very, very rare. Look, in all my life, there's only a couple of times I've seen people being possessed. A lot of other times, it's just... A bit of imagination, not reality. So you don't have to worry about bad beings. Right. There's only especially one more if, question. Oh, sorry. Okay, great. Yeah. Especially if you're in a retreat centre, because in a retreat centre, bad beings can't come in. And this is, people think I'm just exaggerating. But like, you know, if it's in like Body Nyana Monster, where I'm sitting now, there was this case of this indigenous elder, indigenous elder, who was. Uh, going to come and visit us with another person. And this indigenous elder felt the power of Bodhinyana Monastery as he was coming in the gate and said, I can't come in here. He had to stay outside. And the person driving him just let him wait outside. And I thought it was very, you know, not a very nice thing to do. And then he told me afterwards, and I said, all you needed to do is get permission. If I'd have said, yes, he can come in. Once you asked me, told he was waiting outside, of course he'd be able to come in. Same with any sort of other spirits, ghosts or whatever. You know, they, especially like good monks, good nuns, you know, your energy protects the place. The bad beings can't come into those sorts of places. So if you go on a, a residential retreat, amazingly safe. Sorry, what's the last question before I... Okay, yes. So the last one in my box is that I struggle to practice when working on the seventh precept about entertainment and med and meditate more basically when they meditate more they become more sensitive to stimulus and after a while living around a lot of worldly people that sensitivity makes them too open uh, to negative stuff desires and aversions and it creates more aversion than peace so after a while i usually go back to some worldly activities to desensitize myself again have you any advice on how to remain open and meditative and not get down by not very wholesome city surroundings until the times of moving away or ordaining. And that's from Piotr. Yeah. If at all possible, just you know, when you are in a city or a place, have a, your little room, have your empty space or create a bubble around you. And uh, if you do get sensitive to entertainment and stuff, then the sensitivity should actually be wise enough to see the, not the niceness of it, but the negativity in it. You know, the first time I saw a TV after ordaining as a monk was after seven years. I was visiting a house, I think it was in Scotland, and I saw it through two open doors. And I just couldn't believe just how uh, unpleasant it was, how things changed so fast, and how the colours were just so raw, and how the noise was so loud, and things were much faster than real life. So investigate if you wish. You now just watch a movie. I don't know why that's too long, but just know an advertisement on TV and it's really gross. It's, object it's objectionable, it's fast, it's disrespectful and noisy. 
Uh, instead of doing that, just put your head out the window and watch the birds fly past. Much, much more fun. So it has to have a bit of restraint. Restraint based on wisdom, not because you know you deny these things, but as you see their their pain. So be sensitive, but be sensitive to see the the negative part in them, so you can just avoid them. I hope that was a good enough answer because I was getting tired now. I can see that my mind isn't just working as fast or as sharp as it was when we started yes. the quiz, questions and answers. It's time so to I wish think, you it, a good night. Yes, yeah, so and the same to you. And I'll see you again tomorrow morning, your morning, but my afternoon. So have a good, a good day. Have a, you've had your meal already, haven't you? Have a nice I afternoon have. of rest. Okay. Take Bye, care, everybody. everyone. All the best. Bye.